So what I want to talk now about a little bit of what we do with some of the flexibility that we've got inside the ASIC and things that we've already delivered. I'm also going to talk about flexibility we have in silicon beyond just UADP, other types of silicon that we're delivering in the platform. So most people have heard about what we're doing with software defined access or SDA, typical marketing slide on SDA. What I want to do is explain a little bit about software defined access and why we built SDA in the first place, right? So typically when you see somebody talk about software defined access in Cisco, they'll show the GUI, they'll show how easy it is. We saw some of that in Tim's presentation about how easy it is to go configure a new virtual network or you know move groups around between networks with an SDA, all that's very cool. What I want to talk about is a little bit is why we built SDA in the first place. So effectively, when I think about software defined access or putting a fabric in place in the enterprise network using the flexible silicon that we built in platforms like UADP, I think about policy. And policy to me is one of those abstract words. It can mean almost anything you want it to mean. But the reality is, as network engineers, we use policies all the time, right? If you have QoS enabled in your network, putting different traffic into different queues, you have a QoS policy. If you have ACLs, you have a security policy. One of the challenges that drives a lot of complexity into network designs today is that all those policies today are tied to the five tuple. That source IP, DEST IP, source port, DEST port protocol, those 104 bits in the IPv4 header, combined with the six bits of DSCP, are intimately coupled to all the policies we write. Think about writing an ACL in a switch. Effectively, what you're doing is you're, create, you're taking your subnet structure and you're enumerating that into the ACL. I mean, I have customers that I've worked with where they have ACLs that are hundreds or even thousands of lines long. So big and complicated that they don't, they can't even maintain them anymore. The people don't know what those lines in the ACL do. Those were put in by somebody else five years ago. I don't know what they do. I'm scared to take them out because I don't know what I expose or break if I do that, so I just add to the end. And I end up piling complexity on complexity. And the reason for that is because there's no place in that IP header that actually contains explicit user or device information. We use IP addresses as a proxy for that, right? So for example, think about drop, uh, authenticating a user, dropping them into a VLAN, and you're gonna take that VLAN and you know, assign it to a subnet and so that the user that comes up in that subnet, I can take a look at them on the first hop switch or on some firewall five or 10 hops away and say, aha, you came from the subnet, therefore you are this type of device. So I'm using IP address as a proxy for identity. This is why you end up with networks that have hundreds or even thousands of VLANs and subnets in them. Because if the only hammer, you, if the only tool you have is a hammer or a crowbar, like Tim showed <clears> us, <throat> the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything is a nail, right? We solve everything with VLANs and networking, putting in IP phones, video cameras, door locks, badge readers, more VLANs, more subnets, more complexity. And you might say, well, why am I emphasizing this? That's just how we build networks, right? The problem is that make networking so complicated and so hard to move forward that it's really an impediment to getting things done in a lot of organizations, right? Because we overload that IP address with meaning. It also drives important constraints. For example, we go out and talk to customers and say, how many times do you get a request to extend a subnet end to end across campus? And people will say, yes, I get that type of request. And you say, do you do it? I was to go to you and say, can you extend a subnet end-to-end -end for me across campus for my new application that requires layer two or same subnet end-to-end? -end? And most times people will say, no, I won't do that. Why? Because you're exposed to layer two loops, spanning tree issues, broadcast storms, it puts the entire network at risk, right? So <coughs> this drives a lot of complexity into the network environment. The question is, what if we could change the game on this? What if we could just make the IP address be a way to locate you in the network and decouple it from policy. That's effectively what we do with SD access is break this dependence between IP addressing and policy. Lisp is coming then. What's that? Lisp is coming. Yes, this is Lisp. It's based on Lisp. That's exactly what okay, we do. Okay, it's an identity. We use Lisp as a control plane and SD access. We use VXLAN as a data plane. This drives some important things too. It gives us layer two and layer three flexibility. We extend a subnet by default everywhere in the fabric. When you define a subnet in the fabric, we program that into every edge switch. Same IP address, same virtual MAC. On every edge switch, we wrote the packet as soon as it enters the network. You get integrated segmentation. In fact, you get two layers of integrated segmentation, VRFs and SGTs combined. Access list? Yeah. Access list are based on SGTs. Yeah, so that it's SGAC, SGACLs based on groups, not on IP addresses. Yeah. IP, you still have an IP address, but it's not relevant from a policy perspective. And so this is really the magic of what we do with SD access, is creating this concept of the overlay, the underlay, taking all the network devices, putting them in underlay, taking all the users, putting them in overlay, and allowing us to 
effectively create an overlay encapsulation using VXLAN based on the fabric that we saw and based on the, uh, the flexible ASIC that we're using, an overlay control plane just based on this. Right? This is really what we're delivering with SD Access. This is very, very cool. Now all of our policies here can be based on filtering for tags and groups as opposed to being filtered based on IP addresses. Would I be able to extend the VLANs or yes. at least? Yes, well, not only can you extend the subnet, in most cases people are, are, are okay extending a subnet, not actually extending the VLAN or extending the layer two. Most people just want the same subnet to appear everywhere. That actually happens by default in SD Access. You don't have to enable that. As soon as you define a subnet, drop it into the fabric, we program it on every fabric edge switch. The default gateway, we could do a thing called distributed anti-cast default gateway, we program that subnet on every fabric edge switch. It ha still, happens automatically. Still we will do IP and IP. Uh, no, at that point what we're doing is we take IP. It's not IP and IP, we do IP and then wrap it into VXLAN. Come see me later and I'll show you exactly how we do it. Okay, I got it. I'll tell you exactly how we do the end cap. What this allows us to do then is combine two things, virtual networks, VRFs, combined with groups or SGT and providing two levels of segmentation as an inherent property of what the fabric provides. So this effectively also gives us capability for stretch subnets, having the same subnet appear into end. So if I define that, you know, 10100 subnet down here, <coughs> that subnet by default is appearing everywhere on all those fabric edge switches. At the same time, there's no spanning tree in the environment. We terminate the spanning tree only from the edge switch down, not from the edge up. It's all entirely routed and it's all ECMP routing. So I don't have any blocking ports. Everything's in forwarding, right? So I get all the efficiencies of the entire bandwidth that I'm paying for in the environment. These are all inherent properties of what the fabric provides and what that flexible ASIC not only lets us do, but lets us extend back to every switch we've ever made that's based on UADP. Basically, we have layer three routed access then. Yes, and layer three routed access, right? absolutely. Between the devices we have right, IP but you, don't have, but you don't have the compromises that you had to make before with layer three routed access, like being able to only isolate a subnet to one wiring closet. Yeah. Now it's extended end to end. Are you placing some mesh map resolver, map server? Yes, there's a thing called a control plane that runs in here. So effectively, once we separate out that underlay and overlay, we uh, create what's called a, a control plane. It'll be a device running in here, which is a map server, map resolver. All the devices that come up get registered onto the MSMR. And that's a single source of truth where everything is for wired and for wireless, actually. So the other two things I really want to touch on in terms of, of a capability that we've driven in here is a function we call ETA, encrypted traffic analytics. So this is a really cool function that we've driven into the switches, being able to identify encrypted malware in the network without decrypting it. And this was considered an impossible problem to solve because essentially encryption takes data and turns it into noise. That's the job of encryption, to take data and remove the patterns from it. So how do you tell good noise from bad noise? That was considered an impossible problem to solve. One of our Cisco fellows, David McGrew, wrote an, an, an academic paper about two years ago about how you could actually do heuristics on the underlying encrypted data to be able to reliably tell encrypted malware from encrypted benign traffic. So that's effectively what we deliver in the Cat9K using encrypted traffic analytics. We do this by leveraging two functions. First one is called IDP, the initial data packet. We scan the first data packets that set up the encrypting connection. And then we do a thing called SPLT, which is sequence of packet lengths and times. So effectively, what we're doing with IDP is we're taking a look at the packets that set up the encrypted connection. That is a lot we can tell about fingerprinting that encrypted connection when it comes up. So we can typically tell what platforms in use, what browsers in use. And My S friend. Yes, I know. I'm aware. <laughs> and SPLT, we can take a look at the sequence of lengths and times on the packets to effectively fingerprint the connection. So where I'll close off is effectively saying what this lets us do is take packets and either put them into a benign profile or a malware type of profile. Now, what we're able to do with that, for example, if we're fingerprinting a connection, we can take a look at all the traffic going, let's say, from a client to a server, or all the traffic going from a server to a client. This is what a Google search would look like. A Google search in this example, here's Google serving up the initial page load to me here. Then I see you typing the keystrokes, Google's doing auto completion, there's a few packets that bounce back and forth for that. You hit return, they serve up the page refresh, it's all encrypted. We're not decrypting any of that, but it leaves a recognizable Google search fingerprint as opposed to something like a banking Trojan over here. Banking Trojan, self-signed certificate, massive data exfiltration as soon as the connection comes up, and then a command and control message that goes back and forth. Both those things are encrypted. We're not decrypting any of them, but the fingerprints are as different as chalk and cheese. 
So what we're able to do is match that against a cloud-based database, export all that information using NetFlow. That's why we need full flow NetFlow from the UADP ASIC on account 9K, export all that up to StealthWatch, match that against cloud-based signature database, and come back to a very high degree of efficacy as to whether this is actually encrypted <clears throat> malware or encrypted benign traffic. This is a very cool capability that we're able to deliver, and that UADP ASIC is key to being able to deliver it. And so we're leveraging the functionality in this chip to deliver on things like fabric-based networks, encrypted traffic analytics, and other innovations that we drive in the future. And it's the flexible nature of the chip that lets us do this and make it backwards compatible onto existing systems. Does that make sense? Okay, we have lots more to talk about, but I'm gonna stop there. What other questions do you have? Uh, just a quick one. With uh, you mentioned here uh, NetFlow. Yes. Can you also forward uh, something like SFlow with payload, or this is only the header information? We don't. All we what we're really exporting here is effectively the information that we need to to determine the nature of this flow. So for that, I need source IP. I need dest IP. I need source port and dest port, so I can understand what the application is. And especially, I want destination IP, for example, because that destination IP might be matched against a known external threat location, locality, right? It might be coming from some threat actor in another country. Um, so I need that information. Uh, all the information like IDP and STPLT is actually computed on the CPU and in the switch into a, what we call a state vector. And it's a state vector that we're actually exporting in the NetFlow record. So this an analysis about whether this is a good flow or a bad flow, we're doing a, a, the data collection on box. We export that into StealthWatch and StealthWatch is actually making a determination Based so where do you end? Together. Which headers are included in that? What what is the maximum capabilities? The, the, what we export there is five tuple along with the state information for IDP and SPLT. What I know it's a big challenge, but what would be great if you can add additional headers to that? Yeah, at one one time. Yeah, it would be cool, but we don't need them. Yeah. Not for not for this function. I mean, the, the chip has the flexibility to allow us because we can do that 256 byte deep parse. And we can recirculate multiple times. We could do a lot more with it. But to, for this particular application, we're able to export everything that we need out of the switch with just you know, even a more limited header payload. OK. Questions? Other questions? Machine learning? Machine learning. Effectively, doing, we're doing machine learning in the cloud with this because what machine lear the machine learning capability here is referencing is being able to spot um, multiple <coughs> different types of attacks that we see. Right, so, so basically be able to see multiple different attack patterns, because remember, we're not decrypting any of this data, no, no, uh, all based on I, patterns. I, I get that. The problem I have is that machine learning usually assumes that you know in advance what is good and what is bad in the training set. Uh, not necessarily. It depends whether it's guided or unguided learning. Right. If it's guided learning, then typically, yes, a human mm -hmm. is saying, this is good and this is bad. This is, this is a cat and this is not a cat. Yeah. Right. Um, then. Uh, with unguided machine learning, you're basically taking a look at the heuristics of it and saying, this type of heuristic does not, it, it matches against something like a Google search, for example. That is not a, that is a benign flow. That's not a malicious flow. Because we recognize what the heuristic is as we see the packets going across the wire. Yeah, but still, someone had to say a while ago, this is okay, this is Google search. Sure. Uh, 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 originally, but what we're doing is we see more and more of those threats. And mm -hmm. because all the data is encrypted, we're able to, it's kind of automatically anonymized held up into the cloud, and we can see that from many, many, many different customers. 